Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the virtual home of Princeton Public Library here on Zoom. My name is Janie Herman, and I am the Adult Programming Manager at Princeton Public Library. It's my pleasure to host tonight's um, Library and Labyrinth live stream author event for the recent release of the memoir, Koki, A Life Well Lived. Tonight's program is presented in partnership with Labyrinth Books, and I would like to thank Dorothea Momolti for her support, not only for this event, but for dozens and dozens of other events this past year and over the years. We are fortunate to have such a wonderful indie bookstore in the midst of downtown Princeton. I would also like to thank Anne Reeves, who is online with us tonight, uh, as she was instrumental in making this event happen tonight. Thank you, Anne. A few housekeeping items. If you'd like to buy the book, it is available from Labyrinth Books. Uh, you, I hope the link is in the chat, uh, but you can also just stop by in person. I should note that this event is also being recorded and it will be go up on the libraries and Labyrinth YouTube channels within a few days from now. So if you have friends and family that you could not be here tonight, uh, you can have them check there and so they can watch the replay of this. So tonight we will hear about the extraordinary life and legacy of the legendary trailblazing, trailblazing journalist, Koki Roberts. It's gonna be via a conversation between Steve Roberts, her loving husband of 53 years, and Jack Hartman, her grandson who attends Princeton University. Through her visibility and celebrity, Koki Roberts was an inspiration and a role model for, her, for innumerable women and girls. A fixture on the national television and radio, for more than 40 years, she also wrote five best-selling books focusing on the role of women in American history. Koki had many roles in her lifetime, daughter, wife, mother, journalist, advocate, historian. Moreover, Koki was also friends with many in our local community of Princeton via her sister, Barbara Bog Sigmund, who was the mayor of the borough of Princeton in New Jersey here from 1983 to 1990. So at this time, I would like to bring our guests on screen and have them take the conversation away. So up first is Jack Hartman and also Stephen Roberts. I'll bring them both on together. So Jack is a sophomore, as I said, at Princeton University, pursuing a Bachelor of Arts degree in history with a certificate in history and practice of diplomacy. He has an interest in domestic politics, international relations and finance. Stephen Roberts has been a journalist for more than 50 years. He is the author of My Father's Houses and From This Day Forward, co-written with Koki. He is the chief, a chief political analyst for the ABC radio network, a professor of journalism and politics at George Washington University, and a nationally syndicated columnist, as well as so much many other accolades. The biography for, for Stephen could go on for quite a while, but I think we want to turn the conversation over now to, the, uh, to Koki and to this book and to this wonderful memoir that you've written to keep her legacy alive. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good, good evening to everyone. Go ahead, Jack. Fair enough. Uh, so I suppose given that we have so much kind of richness in front of us and there, there are so many, so many different ways that, that we could begin today, I guess the first question that I would ask is, is why uh, did you want to write this book, and and what did you hope to hope to gain from from writing it? Well, a lot of people have asked me that, Jack. And uh, by the way, thanks to the whole Princeton the Library and to the bookstore. And as you mentioned, um, our family has long connections to Princeton. Jack, only the latest <laughs> example of it. Um, and um, I'll tell you that uh, uh, after Cokie died, Jack. Um, I gave a eulogy, as you remember, at the National Cathedral. You were part of that funeral. You were read one of the <laughs> one of the uh, uh, lessons, and um, you remember that the stories I told um, were so. Uh, they were just stories about her life. They and 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 I got this enormous reaction to it of of people wanting to hear more stories, and really that gave me the idea to do the book that there were lessons here in her life, and. Um, there were really two lessons. One was the public Koki um, that um, so many of our, our listeners tonight know well. They saw her on TV, listened to her uh, on radio for 40 years. Uh, and particularly for young women, Jack, um, uh, she was such a role model. Um, and uh, I, I, I talked to so many young women who 
told me in one form or another, you know, I would watch Cokie on TV or my mother would make me watch Cokie on TV or listen to on the radio. And, and, she, and, and I would think I can be that smart. I can be that strong. I can be myself. And that was the public side of, of your grandmother. Um, an enormous inspiration to many people. But as you know, because you lived with her for so long, um, there was a private side to Cokie. And, and, and she did something good for um, somebody else every single day. She lived the gospel, Jack, and she um, she was a believing Catholic, as you well know, and it helped shape her view of the world in a profound way. And um, um, and sometimes those those that generosity of spirit was directed to her grandchildren, sometimes to her children, sometimes to many other people. And um, you know, I, as I did the book, I realized that. Yes, the, the public cookie was very inspirational and very important, but not everybody can be a TV star, right? Not everybody can be on the radio. Everybody can be a good person. Everybody can learn something from Cookie's life about how you live your life every day in ordinary small ways, being a good friend and a good neighbor and a good grandmother. And, um, and in, in many ways, I thought that was even more important than the public cookie because Everybody can learn something from that. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that's really why I did it. Wonderful. And I, so you mentioned really wanting to bring out that personal side of Koki, kind of in addition to what everyone was able to see on, on ABC or, or here on NPR. And obviously, unfortunately, we're not, we're not able to be in person here in Princeton tonight, but I assume there is a, a very strong Princeton contingent um, in the audience. And so can you talk a little bit about her connections to the town and kind of what the town meant to her and, and to her family uh, around her? Yeah, well, you know, um, there are a great many connections. Uh, and in, in some ways, uh, one of the connections started even before Koki and I met. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but of course, her sister Barbara was, was mayor for seven years, as was mentioned. But her, uh, but Barbara's husband, Paul Sigmund, was a longtime politics professor at Princeton. That's how Barbara got to Princeton, was because she married Paul. But back in 1962, Jack, Paul Sigmund, your uncle, was a young teaching fellow at Harvard. And I took my Gov1 class with Paul Sigmund at Harvard. So we actually met the two sisters. We actually met before either one was met the two sisters we, we married a few years later. Uh, and then um, Paul went off to Princeton, became a tenured professor, a very distinguished professor in the politics department. Barbara joined him. They got married in Princeton. Um, and uh, we visited them many, many times. You had three boy cousins in, in Princeton, uh, or, or I guess their, uncle, their second cousins, they're uh, older than you. But um, we were there all the time. And um, and then your mother um, decides to apply to Princeton. And uh, one of the main reasons your mother applied to Princeton was because of your Aunt Barbara. And um, Barbara had three sons and never had a daughter. And so the notion of your mom going to Princeton was very important both to your mother and to your aunt. And there's uh, two wonderful stories about um, leaving a bar, uh, leaving um, uh, your mother off at Princeton uh, and in the fall of 1988. And um, uh, we were staying with Barbara and Paul. They had this wonderful old house on Evelyn Place right off Nassau Street. And um, so we were getting ready to go to dinner and your mother calls up stairs and says, Aunt Barbara, do you have a pair of stockings I can borrow? And your Aunt Barbara says, finally, a girl child in my house asking for a pair of stockings. I've waited 20 years for this. Um, and of course, your mother feels that way too, since she had just three boys as well. But the next day we were leaving your mom at, on campus and she was always a very um, placid, I'm not placid, she was a very well-meaning child and never had any problems and very loyal, very loving. And yet we stayed too long, we made a big mistake. We stayed too long and she was really eager for us to leave. And so she basically just waved us goodbye and said, you know, we stay through lunch, never stay through lunch when you're dropping a child off at college. And so um, we waved goodbye and we're feeling kind of bruised. I mean, here was this loving child of ours, just sort of not a tear, not a 
blink. She couldn't wait for us to leave. So Koki and I are leaving the camp, Princeton campus and we're feeling, as I say, a little bruised. And we see a young woman weeping into the arms of her parents as, as they're leaving. And Koki turns to me and says, now there's a satisfying child. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, of course, Becca was there at Princeton, your, your mom, from, for four years. Uh, she, uh, one of her major uh, uh, activities was uh, singing. She sang with a wonderful women's group called the Tigressians, and they used to do arch singing all the time, that great Princeton tradition on football Saturdays primarily of singing under the arches of the wonderful buildings with the great acoustics. And uh, your grandmother and I spent many Saturday nights following your mother around as groupies um, around the Princeton campus um, uh, as she sang with her with her group. And um, so there were just a great many ways. And uh, but the final poignant and uh, not the final one, but one of the things that attached us to Princeton when your Aunt Barbara uh, got sick uh, during your mother's junior year and um, and uh, with her what proved to be a fatal illness. Well, she had had cancer years before, but then it recurred. And um, so your mother was just a junior at, at, at Princeton, and, and yet she insisted on helping to care for your aunt uh, through her final illness. And uh, it's not the way you normally want someone to spend their junior year in college, but your mother kept saying, I'm a Boggs woman. <laughs> this is what I'm supposed to do. So. Um, we have a great many wonderful ties. And of course, then when you decided to go to Princeton and, uh, and were accepted and decided to go, it was just uh, one more link in a wonderful chain. For sure, for sure. And I suppose going, going a little bit deeper on that, obviously uh, Barbara is a figure that's probably known to, to our Princeton audience here, obviously being, being mayor of the town, but maybe not as well known as kind of part of Koki's life. To the to the wider national audience that that this book will reach, is there anything that that you wanted to explicitly include about the relationship in the book? Anything that you felt was was really important to include that really painted the picture of, of who Koki was? Well, you know, Koki and Barbara had a had, had a very close relationship. Barbara was three years older, um, and one of the connections they had, Jack, was through the Sacred Heart Order, the Order of Nuns that trained them both. And actually Barbara's first job when she got to Princeton, when she married Paul was at Stuart Hall, the Sacred Heart School there in Princeton. And uh, so they were taught by many of the same nuns. Um, and uh, it's a, it, it was a powerful connection that they, both women shared was, uh, and Koki in fact, at one point dedicated one of her books to the nuns of the Sacred Heart and said, they took girls seriously in the 1950s, which was not, very, very common. Um, I do think that, um, you know, in some ways, uh, uh, Koki lived the life that Barbara had hoped for. Uh, you know, Barbara ran twice for a political office beyond Princeton. She ran for nomination for the U.S. Senate, was defeated by Frank Lautenberg, and then ran for Democratic nomination for governor, was defeated by Jim Florio. But Barbara poured this enormous talent an enormous energy uh, and, and enormous vitality into being mayor of Princeton. And that's why today people still remember her with such um, fondness and, and such affection. I was just talking yesterday to a former student of mine uh, named Bill Baroni, who uh, represented uh, Hamilton Township in the state legislature outside of Princeton. And he was saying, even now, he, people talk to him all the time. Uh, about your aunt Barbara, so um, it's it, it. Princeton, even though there were disappointments in Barbara's life about not moving on to the national stage, Princeton was the beneficiary, of, in a way, of her disappointments because they got all of Barbara, <laughs> which was a lot. <laughs> well, you mentioned briefly how Barbara was in office, and actually ran for higher office and and koki famously comes came from a, a family of of many office holders obviously uh her parents both congressmen her father a potential speaker of the house had he not tragically died in, in a plane crash her brother another unsuccessful candidate for for the house do you think that koki ever regretted not running for office or 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 wished that she had done so herself 
kind of looking back on her career? Uh, the way she put it was that she was semi guilty. Um, because uh, uh, one of the things that um, uh, Koki uh, uh, believed strongly was that journalism was public service. And I think she was right about that. Uh, and as you point out, of, of the five people in that nuclear family, um, your great grandparents, Helen, Lindy, Barbara, uh, and Koki, and their brother, Tommy, Koki was the only one of the five who never ran for Congress. As Koki also pointed out, the only one in the family who never lost an election was her mother. Um, but, um, they were, you know, and, and, and Koki had great affection for, um, for Princeton and, and, uh, and, and admired Barbara's work there. Um, to this day, the, the, the women's space is a, an important institution that Koki was always a strong supporter of one of Bar something that Barbara did as a refuge for, um, for abused women. And, um, uh, it was a, um, uh, and, I, and I think Koki in another life would have run for office, Jack, uh, but she, you know, she said, well, I became a journalist because I married one <laughs> and that Stephen was going to be a journalist from the time I was 10 or 12, which is true. I, I'm also a native of New Jersey, as you know, from Bayonne, New Jersey. And um, I, uh, that was true. I was headed for that kind of career. And so when we um, uh, when we met each other and married, uh, she realized she couldn't run for office and be married to a journalist or it would be very awkward. So, uh, but late in her life, last uh, 15, 17 years of her life, uh, she quit her job as the anchor of the uh, ABC uh, Sunday program. And one of the main reasons she did, Jack, was so that she could be freer under the ethics rules of ABC to be more directly an advocate for uh, issues she cared about. And like her sister, Barbara, um, what they had very much in common was this focus on the welfare and rights of women as, as a major part of their public um, focus and, and priorities. And um, so she joined the board of uh, an organization called Save the Children and went around the world um, learning about programs uh, that they had in various uh, countries uh, advocating for them. She was their spokesman. Um, and that, I think, filled in a piece uh, that uh, was left open there. Because as you point out, um, not only was it their Barbara and Koki's parents, both members of Congress, their father spent 30 years in the Congress, uh, their mother 18. Um, as you know, we don't believe in term limits in our family. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, going back to the earliest days, your twin brother is named Claiborne, Claiborne Hartman. And Claiborne, the first Claiborne came to America in 1620. The first Claiborne elected to the Congress was elected in 1797. Um, the, uh, there was a, a fellow at the Brookings Institution, Steve Hess, who did a book, Jack, uh, trying to uh, rate uh, different families in American history, uh, according to the different offices they held, and he gave a numerical value to each office. And so the original book, number one were the Roosevelt's, number two were the Kennedy's, number three were the Claiborne's, you, you know, mom's family. Cokie's middle name was Claiborne, your great-grandmother was Lindy Claiborne, and as I say, your brother is Claiborne. And so, um, but you're, you can imagine Cokie doing this, you just hear her, right? She reads the manuscript and says, Steve, to Steve Hess, the author, you have missed six members of my family. <laughs> and <laughs> she forced him to recalibrate all of his rankings and rewrite the book. And now the Claiborne's are number two in American history, second only to the Roosevelt's. And that's because the Roosevelt's had two presidents and you can't compete with them. But so there's a pretty long lineage here. It just doesn't start with your great grandparents. And, um, but you know, journalism is public service, Jack. Uh, I've always felt that. And, I think your grandmother did too. Yeah, I know there were, there may have been a, a brief period of, of, of panic and a few years ago when Jeb Bush was running for president, the Bushes could have could have overtaken the Claiborne's, but <laughs> as as of now they can they can maintain maintain their ranking. Um maybe maybe find maybe find some uh some younger some younger uh Claiborne's to, yeah, to boost well, their are... numbers a little bit. Yeah, maybe I'll have to get I'll have to get my brother into office. Um but <laughs> where he wears the name proudly, that's for sure. So I suppose to, to reset the deck here a little bit and kind of go back to 
to kind of the beginnings of your relationship. How how did you and Koki meet? And and kind of can you talk a little bit about some of the earliest details that you include in the book? Well, we we were college sweethearts in in sort of a very traditional sense. We met. Actually, Barbara had something to do with our meeting because we were both got involved in the National Student Association. Barbara had been involved before us. She was two, three years older. She was a delegate from Manhattanville, the Catholic Women's College in Westchester County where that she attended. And so both of us um, got involved in this organization. And uh, we went to the um, summer uh, convention in the summer of 1962 at Ohio State University. And uh, Koki had met my twin brother, you know, a lot of twins in our family, and uh, had met my twin brother, Mark. And the way she always told the story, she looked across the room at this convention and saw someone that looked a whole lot like Mark Roberts, but not quite like Mark Roberts. And she goes over and um, she sees my name tag and says, Steve Roberts, are you Mark Roberts' brother? And I, I said, yes. And I looked at her name tag and I said, are you Barbara Boggs' sister? And that's, that's how we met. And um, Fortunately, uh, we realized that our dorms were six and a half, uh, 12 and a half miles apart back in Boston. I was at Harvard, she was at Wellesley. And um, she actually asked me out uh, in one of our first dates. Uh, uh, she was a singer, like your mother. Uh, she was a singer all through college and, and like your mother, um, loved women's voices, always wanted to sing just with women, not in mixed choruses. And so uh, she was, uh, uh, had a starring role in the junior show at Wellesley, a, a, some kind of musical event. And of course, since I was such a big spender, Jack, I took her out afterwards to the Howard Johnson's in Wellesley Village afterwards, a, a magnificent meal. And uh, uh, that was one of our first dates, but I was a t typical jerk. Um, I didn't call again for months. And I, I had never had a serious girlfriend. And it, the whole idea sort of baffled me. Um, but also she was Catholic and I was Jewish and there was sort of the assumption that we could never get around this. And um, again, there are so many themes here that connect because your Aunt Barbara played yet another role in, in connecting us because Barbara at this point had graduated and was working with the National Student Association and was or organized a big meeting in Washington. Uh, on the idea of a domestic Peace Corps. President Kennedy, of course, had created the Foreign Peace Corps. There was a lot of talk there should be a domestic version. And so Barbara organized a big convention here in Washington at American University. And uh, so a whole group of us were supposed to come down to Washington that spring. Uh, and I hadn't seen Koki for months, but um, we had organized that we would all drive down together in, in the same car. And so uh, I remember approaching the car parked on a side street in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and seeing Koki through the back window and saying to myself, you idiot, <laughs> this is the girl. What the hell have you been doing? And we really were together forever after that weekend. But we came down here and lots of folks, a lot of guys were supposed to stay right here at this house where I'm sitting right now, House of Bradley Boulevard, that your great-grandparents bought in 1952 uh, and was Cokie's girl at home, Barbara's girl at home. And uh, so, um, uh, but it turned out that all the other guys didn't come. So I was the only guy staying here at this house. And the first night I was here, this is a story I've told many times, I was ensconced in Cokie's girlhood room on the second floor here. and. Um, I had a terrible cough because I was spending the winter in Boston. You always have a cough in Boston. And I hear a knock on the door. Now, this is 1963, Jack, so I'm figuring it's not Cokie. And in walks your great-grandmother, the future member of Congress, the future ambassador to the Vatican, right? And my future mother-in-law, wearing this off-the-shoulder peach-colored negligee and saying, why, darling, you sound terrible. Drink this. At which point, I mean, I was in shock, Jack. I had never met anybody like this in Bayonne, New Jersey, believe me. And I'm sure what she gave me was two thirds bourbon at least. Um, and of course, as you know, the joke in the family was I fell in love with Mama first and eventually got around the cookie, which was you know, a lot of truth to that. But the next night, there are, again, there was a, a fellow who really was in love with Cokie who went to, of all places, Yale University, uh, a place we can mutually despise. And, um, and so 
he was angling to take her home, but I was staying here. So I had the inside track. So we came and the next night we stayed up all night talking uh, in a room directly below where I'm sitting right now. And that was the first time, Jack, that we started dimly, tentatively, started to see that there maybe was a path forward, that the stereotypes and prejudices people were trying to impose on us, the labels and the, and the differences that people were emphasizing were not as important as what we really shared. And, and that first night, uh, we stayed up all night, you know, and, and she made some scrambled eggs at six o'clock in the morning. Then we got back in the car and drove back to Boston. But um, that was the real beginning. And that was the spring we fell in love. And that's why the ring I wear, which I still wear, is inscribed forever spring. Um, now that took four more years before we were able to fight through. We were very young. Uh, we had these um, religious differences. Um, but, um, and my parents in particular were very uneasy about this relationship. And my father wrote me a five page single space letter telling me how it could never work. And I wrote him back and I said, well, dad, there's one difference between us. I'm in love and you're not. And uh, you can imagine when your grandmother and great grandmother, two of the most charming women in American history, both focused on my father and try to convince him that this was going to work. He didn't have a chance, right? I mean, he was he, he was out of the game. And finally, their combined offensive uh, did its work. And he said to me on the eve of the, uh, of the marriage, which happened right here in this yard of this house where I'm sitting. And he said, well, Stephen, it'd be so much easier to oppose this marriage if it wasn't so obvious. She's the perfect girl for you. And then I knew it was going to be okay, Jack. No, uh, certainly fond memories for you. And, and obviously, you faith was a, was a big part of your early relationship, as you mentioned. And, and you've now gone on to, to write a book about interfaith marriage and counsel hundreds of, of interfaith couples on, on kind of the way forward in that regard. What influence do you think faith had on, on Koki and how do you think it shaped both her personally, professionally, and kind of um, what she took from that? Well, it's a good question, Jack, and it, and, and it, was, it was profound. And it had several uh, manifestations. Uh, the first and most obvious was that she lived the gospel. She was trained by the nuns at a very young age with the most, one of the most basic adages of any religious tradition, to whom much is given, much is expected. And she actually believed it, and she actually lived it. And, and, and um, I think you can trace so much of, uh, of her personal generosity and friendship and, and, and compassion to, it, it, was, it was good works in the world, Jack. It was, it was a mission, um, and, and a mission rooted very deeply in her religious faith. Um, although she shared, because she was trained by women, uh, nuns, she also, her faith always had an edge of bitterness about the a resentment uh, about the male domination of the Catholic Church. She used to say, you know, the nuns told us we could grow up to be anything except priests. <laughs> and there was always a bitter touch to that comment. And, but she insisted, she said, I am not going to let the male hierarchy drive me from this church. It's my church. I'm, it's, I have a personal relationship to God and to Jesus, and I am going to stay, and I'm going to, on my own terms. And uh, she, she was once asked by a, an interviewer, what's your favorite Sunday morning news show? And she said, Mass, <laughs> which is what she believed. And, uh, and she was very open about her faith. Um, the first day she ever worked for ABC, I was told the story by a young producer was there that morning. And, and Koki walks in and she's in her mid forties at this point, but she you know, not intimidated by the fact that she was auditioning for a network TV job, right? And she says to this producer, Mark, there are three things you need to know about me. I've been married to the same man for 20 years. I live in the house I grew up in and I go to church every Sunday. And if you understand those three things, we're gonna get along fine. And this fellow said to me, Steve, on all the years I've known you both, the only thing that changed was the number of years you were married. Otherwise it was always the same story. So. Uh, it guided her in, in profound ways. Um, and uh, 
not only in her personal life, but when I mentioned, you know, going around the world and, and uh, for Save the Children, that was that was a religious mission. That was a religious calling in, its, in, 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 in a very profound way. But there was another thing that really happened that uh, was, was really remarkable. Because she was a woman of faith, she took all faith seriously and all religion seriously. And so when we married and we had this understanding that we would raise our children in both faiths, she said, okay, pal, <laughs> you got to get serious now. And I was raised in a very Jewish family, but in a tribal sense, we, and not in a ritualistic sense. Uh, there are a lot of isms in our family, but Judaism was not one of them. It was Zionism and socialism and, and politics. And so she said, look, you know, if we're going to do this, we're going to have to do these rituals because as she pointed out, I kind of knew I was Jewish because of history and culture and the food my grandmother cooked and all of that. She said, if I was going to be part of, of Judaism, my connection was through ritual. And of course, that's was how she practiced Catholicism, going to mass every week. And so, so she was the one who insisted that we create these rituals. My mother often said that the first Passover Seder she ever went to was organized by her Catholic daughter-in-law. And um, she embraced my Jewish heritage with such joy, Jack, and with such enthusiasm. And um, as some of the folks on this call will know that um, at Passover, uh, the book that is uh, contains all the stories, the prayers, the legends is called the Haggadah. And Koki decided she was going to write her own, um, mainly one that would be uh, compatible with an interfaith family. And so after we've been married just a couple of years, she sat about writing a Haggadah. She took pieces from different uh, books. And that was sort of a mimeograph version we used in our Passover seders for over 30 years. And um, and then folks in the Jewish book world heard about our Haggadah and asked us to publish it. So um, we were preparing the manuscript for publication. And I looked at it and I said, well, some of this language needs some freshening. So I started editing it. And your grandmother was furious, Jack. She came to me and said, you can't change a word of that. This is sacred text. We've been using it for a generation. Now, I didn't stay happily married to that woman for 53 years by ignoring those moments, right? Nor did you as a grandson ignore those moments. So when she was serious, she was serious. So I said, okay, dear, write whatever you say. And then she started changing the text. And I said, wait, Koki, you told me it was sacred. I couldn't change a word. And she said, yes, Stephen, I told you, you couldn't change a word. But since I wrote it, I can change it now. We came to a a, a, a working detente and a, a diplomatic understanding on this. But two, two final things on this point. I venture to say, Jack, she is the only daughter of an ambassador to the Vatican to write a Passover Haggadah. I think I'm safe in saying that. But also she was such a, uh, she was so joyous and so forceful in embracing my Judaism that as you know, she was known as the best Jew in our family. She always pointed out there wasn't a lot of competition for the title. It was a pretty low bar. But the truth is, she also spoke at a great many Jewish events over the years uh, uh, and was a favorite at, at all these events around the country. And she was actually made a life member of Hadassah, which is a Zionist women's organization that uh, uh, supports uh, health care in Israel. So not only was she a daughter of the ambassador of the Vatican who wrote a Haggadah, she also was a life member of Hadassah, which was emblematic of, of how important faith was to her. Uh, and it changed our lives, it changed my life. Well, certainly wonderful insight into, into Koki, kind of the person and, and a side that I think is, is not necessarily drawn out as much in, in what most people know about her, though I guess to pivot to, I guess how most people have seen her mm -hmm. up to now, how did Koki become a journalist and, and, and why, kind of why and how did that occur? Um, well, it's a long story. Uh, you know, as, as I mentioned, um, she said she became a journalist largely because she married one. And, um, uh, but um, her first job out of college, um, she actually worked for a small TV production company and hosted her own TV show. Uh, and it was a, uh, it was on the local NBC station here in Washington. It was a, it was a measure of life in 1966 that uh, it was always just assumed that the guy's job was more important 
I had been hired on the city staff in the New York Times as a reporter. It was a, it was a pretty good job, but her job was at least as good, if not better. And he just decided we were going to move to New York. And um, she ran into enormous discrimination and doors slammed in her face. Um, now, this is a woman, Jack, who eventually wrote five national best-selling books and was told repeatedly by Newsweek magazine and many other places, we do not hire women to be writers. Think about that. We don't even hire them because there's some genetic disability here that women are not capable of you know, putting words on paper. It's just astounding when you think about it, but it was true. And it was very depressing to her. And, and uh, uh, she was very unhappy uh, in those first year or two in New York. Um, but um, eventually she got a job at a small newsletter. She started writing small stories and she got a taste for journalism. It was just a taste. We moved to uh, California again for my job and she was producing television shows, but for children, but it was a part-time job and she had a lot of time on her hands and um, your uncle Lee had been born and then your mother was born and in California. And um, she was kind of stuck on a mountaintop in Malibu with two little babies and she wanted to get out of there on a more regular basis. So we hit on a scheme. I was the New York Times correspondent and I was being offered all of these opportunities to write because it was the best story in the world. The sex, drugs and rock and roll in Southern California, late sixties, early seventies. So we hit on this scheme that Koki would do the research for the article, I'd write it, should edit it, and would have a double byline. And so we did a, a number of these stories together and she herself described it as a one-man journalism school um, that she went through. But then we moved to Europe again for my job to Athens. And this is the moment that was the real breakthrough. Uh, she uh, connected with CBS and said, well, I'd like, maybe I can do some part-time reporting for you from Athens. And they said, fine, they gave her tape recorder. And she was very excited about that. She, that, you know, was a mark of, she was gonna be a real journalist. And uh, we got to Athens for first two months. She's putting, you know, your mother was three, your uncle Lee was five, puts them in school, gets the house settled. And she cables CBS and says, I'm ready to do some work for you now. No more than a couple of days later, there was a coup in Cyprus, which is part of my territory. Um, Right-wing generals had deposed the left-wing government and virtually every reporter from that part of the world got to, went to Cyprus. And then the Turks invaded Cyprus to reverse the coup. Koki's back in Athens with, you know, the three-year-old mother and five-year-old uncle. And um, she gets a cable from CBS saying, the Turks have invaded Cyprus. Can you file a radio report in 30 minutes? At that moment, think about, this was one of the founding mothers of NPR one of the great radio voices of her generation, had never done a radio report in her life, never. And so she makes her way down to Reuters, the Reuters office where I had some friends and connections. She cobbles together a piece. Two days later, the military government in Greece falls. And it's a much bigger story than the coup in Cyprus. Cyprus was a side light. Greece is a NATO country, fall of a military government. It's the biggest story in the world that night. And Koki was virtually the only English language reporter in Athens because the rest of us were all in Cyprus. And so she tells the story about she was downtown in Athens and she hears these corns blaring and people shouting. She realizes it's just been announced that the military government is giving way to a civilian government. And so she holds her tape recorder up the CBS has given her and she gets all of the sound of the excitement. And she goes to this uh, flower stall along the side uh, of the main square of Athens. And in those days, technology was pretty rudimentary. And to get audio back to CBS in New York, she had to unscrew the telephone and have these clips that transmitted the audio from her tape recorder to the phone. This guy thinks she's from the CIA. The guy runs this, <laughs> this flower stall is screaming at her. And she finally says, calm down, calm down. I'll buy a lot of flowers from you when I'm through. She gets the report out and that night, CBS calls your great grandmother and says, Mrs. Boggs, uh, can, do you have a picture of your daughter? And she freaks and what's wrong? What's wrong? She says, no, no, there's nothing wrong. But the only report we have out of Athens, it's, it's the biggest story in the world. It's leading the Walter Cronkite show tonight. But the only report we have is Cokie's radio report. So we're gonna run the audio and we wanna run her picture next to it. 
I had no idea that any of this was happening. I was in Cyprus under fire. The next six, seven, eight days, Koki's filing continuously. Biggest story in the world. And the main CVS guy was stuck with me back in Athens, back in Cyprus. So in, um, uh, I finally got out of Cyprus. I got back to Athens and I walked through the door, Jack, and found I was married to a veteran foreign correspondent. <laughs> um, and that was really her breakthrough. But when, but still she was not a full-time reporter. We got back to uh, Washington a few years later and um, uh, she was very unhappy about being back. And uh, I uh, took my, I, I found a desk. I was given a desk in the New York Times Bureau. It was my first day back from the Washington Bureau of the New York Times. Again, we moved from my job. I saw a young woman next to me who I didn't recognize. I asked her name. I said, where'd you used to work? She said, National Public Radio. And I said, Jack, what's that? <laughs> because I had never heard of it before. We had, it had been in existence for six years, but for four years. Um, uh, after uh, for four years, we had been in Europe. And uh, so I said, my God, it sounds like the perfect place for my wife to work. What do I do? And she said, call my friend, Nina Totenberg, who to this day is, of course, one of our closest friends and was then the Supreme Court correspondent and it is today. And so the next day I brought Koki's resume over to NPR and the rest is history. Uh, but there's an important footnote there, Jack, because that was the first moment I saw the old girls network at work where women could do for each other what men had always done. And you no, know, 10 years at NPR and then ABC came calling and there she was, she was launched. For sure, for sure. Well, thank you so much for sharing, sharing that insight. I believe uh, we are about to enter the Q&A portion of the program. I don't know if I'm, if I'm gonna turn it over to you yeah. for to, to manage the uh, questions. Hi everybody, yeah. So I'll manage the questions and the questions can be for either Jack or for Steven. And in fact, one of our first questions uh, from the audience is a question for you, Jack, um, because I think we're curious about um, if you could say something about the influence that Koki had on your life as her grandson and about your own relationship with her. Of course, I think I think the one the one thing that I would always make a point of in, in describing my relationship with Koki is that I was I was very lucky that I got to I got to do both, quote unquote, and that I did a lot of kind of traditional grandmotherly grandson things. Like I, I still cook using recipes that probably passed down from her grandparents from Louisiana. Like I, I, I got to do kind of things that you would think of and she was a great cook too. And like, that was something that we shared kind of in the kitchen, but also I, I got to go to the White House and I got to go to the Library of Congress and meet cool people and go cool places. And like, so, I was tremendously lucky and privileged that I had both like a very kind of traditional grandmother grandson relationship and then had all this cool stuff that I could do on the side with with what Koki did professionally. And and so for that, I think I, I was really lucky. And that's something that I've always cherished was kind of that ability to kind of to have to have both of those things. Um, yeah, and it comes through even here on screen, your relationship with your grandfather here, his conversations has been delightful to see your rapport that you have with each other. You can tell the warmth that's in your family for each other, and um, that's really great. Okay, so one question here, uh, this is for Stephen, is how do you feel that Koki's Sacred Heart education influenced her life? Um, as you did mention, we do have a Sacred Heart school here in Princeton, Stewart Country Day, and, and that's where Barbara taught. So. Um, Right. obviously had a big influence on both of their lives in some ways, but how do you feel it influenced uh, Koki's life? Well, you're absolutely right that uh, Sacred Heart and uh, Stuart, I'm glad you mentioned Stuart Country Day School. Interestingly, the new head of that school is the sister of a former student of mine. Um, and, and so the, uh, the connections continue. Um, but I think it was, um, I, I mentioned some of the, uh, uh, some of the ways, it, um, because uh, girls were taken seriously from a very young age uh, she really felt confident. She felt that she could do things. Now she, I, I don't think she, she felt she could do that necessarily in a professional sense, because she, but um, there's a wonderful story, uh, Barb, which involves Barbara. And uh, so um, uh, the summer before Koki uh, went, um, uh, went to college, um, 
Barbara and Cookie was only 16 because she had skipped grade. And Barbara met a woman named Marsha Burek at one of these student political meetings I've been talking about. And, Bar and Marsha was a delegate from Wellesley. And so uh, Barbara says to uh, Marsha, well, my little sister is only 16 and uh, she was taught by nuns and she's very shy. Can you imagine Koki <laughs> being described as shy? So uh, my, uh, Marsha uh, agrees to become Koki's big sister. And she tells me the story about, she's looking around, they're having a picnic to meet all the freshmen. And she's looking around for this meek little 16 year old and in blast this tornado of energy uh, and, and took over the picnic because she, you know, she was just, first week of freshman year but remember this was fall of 1960s right before the kennedy election she was you know knew more about politics and all the rest of the girls put together but what the, the the connection to the nuns there was that she had the confidence to do that the nuns had imbued her with that sense of of, of vitality and that sense of uh, you can do anything as i say except being a priest and in fact uh, there was another sacred heart school in boston called newton college of the sacred heart of simple it's since been absorbed by Boston College. But a lot of the nuns from Stewart and from Stone Ridge and had taught Barbara and Cokie were in were at Newton. And early in our relationship, she trotted me out one Sunday afternoon to meet the nuns at Newton College. And it was clear that I was on display there. And if they didn't approve, this relationship was off because she trusted the nuns. She trusted their judgment. And, and they left her with such a strong sense of, you know, Going to a girls' school and, and being taught by women, and this is true, of course, at Wellesley, too, but even more profoundly at, uh, uh, at, at, at Sacred Heart, um, this sense of all of her models of, of inspiration were women. And it, it, so when you think about this, that she wrote five books rescuing and, re, and, and reviving the stories of women in history, I mean, it's a direct line. It's, it's a direct line between her, the training she got from the nuns and her interest in exploring the roles women have played in history. So, oh, and Ellen Dowling in the chat has also reminded us that we have actually have two Sacred Heart schools here in Princeton, because we also have the Princeton Academy of the Sacred Home of the Heart, which is an all boys, the brother school to Stuart. And um, okay, so we have someone here who's uh, putting uh, in the in the chat, um, it's not so much a question as a little anecdote that they have about Koki from when they were at uh, Wellesley that she thinks Steve might not know about because it was about him. And this is uh, Crystal Chavelle who knew Koki at Wellesley and she's sharing that they were both members of the Wesley Widows. W Wellesley Widows, yes. At Wellesley Widows, a sing an acapella singing group and she, um, she had a great voice, could take a classic song and rearrange it. Um, and director at that time. And one afternoon during rehearsal, when Koki was a senior, she did something unusual. She talked about herself, which I, and she told us there was a guy in her life and she was wondering whether to take him seriously. And that's when uh, Crystal first heard your name, Stephen Roberts. And she said, <laughs> um, if she was asking for advice, we didn't give any, we just supported whatever she said. And now she's glad to know how it all turned out in the end with, by this conversation tonight. Sure. So thank you for joining us, Crystal, and, and sharing your story of the time that you knew Koki uh, growing up. Well, you know, in during that uh, period when uh, uh, we were seniors and, and Koki was the head of the Wiz Widows and I was working as this uh, part-time reporter for the New York Times. And so our classic Saturdays when we were seniors in college, Koki would come to Boston and I would cover uh, come to Cambridge. I would cover like a swim meet or a uh, hockey game and I would get the princely sum of $5 from the mm -hmm. New York Times for covering this. But there was a restaurant in Harvard Square called Cronin's, which had a $1.95 special. So my $5 covered dinner for two. And then in the evening, I'd follow the Wellesley Widows and wherever they went to sing. So I was a groupie. I was a groupie of the Wellesley Widows, uh, a proud groupie. And uh, Koki, and I would listen to her because she was the head of the group, so she was the MC, And I knew all of her spiel, all of her jokes, all of her introductions. So it was pretty good introduction to 53 years of marriage. I, I learned to listen to Koki very early on. Okay, so uh, we have a question here from Ruda Smithson, um, who wants to know, uh, what do you think Koki would think about the status of the media today? Um, and this um, this can go for either Jack or Stephen, and also, but also for Steve, what do you think about the status of media today? 
Well, I, I'll, I'll let Jack start if he wants to. Yeah, I mean, I obviously I come at this from a from a slightly different perspective, having a, a much more limited exposure to media, and then also not working in the industry. But I I would say that I I am slightly worried about the state of of the media today, and that we we don't have the kind of um, titans of the industry that that we did. I don't know one, two, three, four, five decades ago. Um, and I think that someone like Koki is, is that, that role is kind of beginning to be lost a little bit um, in kind of what, in what news content and what media is produced. And so I, I think it's, it's something that it's not necessarily my ocean to, to speak about. I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over uh, for, for Steve, who has a lot more to say, but um, I, I think there is some concern on my, and I think we all could, we could use, people, more people like Koki uh, in the media um, moving forward. Well, I would agree with you on that, Jack. So I, I think that Koki stood for a set of values. Now, look, even though she came from a very openly democratic household, right? Everybody knew, look, in the year, Koki and I covered Congress together for eight years, from 78 to 86. She was the NPR correspondent. I was the New York Times correspondent. We commuted together. We covered the same stories. And, and everybody knew that, and her mother was a member of Congress right, during those years. And yet she was so scrupulously professional and so scrupulously fair that no one ever accused her of tilting one way or another. And, um, and that is, is a model that I think we miss sometimes uh, in, 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 in modern journalism. I, it's a long topic and I, you know, I teach a whole course in it and I'm not gonna bore the, the audience with the syllabus, but, I would say one other thing though, that one, one positive thing that's happened, Koki was a pioneer in terms of diversity in the, in the media. When I started um, in 1964 and got hired by the New York Times, virtually everybody looked like me, a white male, generally straight, Ivy League educated. We represented a very narrow view of the world. And, and, and as Koki came in and so many other women came in, they changed the whole nature in, for the better of the press corps and today it's yet another whole dimension um, toward diversity uh, with uh, uh, with race and ethnicity and, and and it's so much healthier to have uh, news reported by people who have so many such a broader view of the world than than my uh, contemporaries did but one of the things that Koki, in particularly in those early years it was so important to have women reflecting the interests that women had. And she always told the story that I tell in the book. There was a story we were both covering. There was a big budget summit, you know, long forgotten now, but it was important at the time. And so the budget negotiators come out and the big issue for all the guys was, was there funding in the bill for a particular missile called the MX missile? And everybody's shouting questions. Is the MX missile in the bill? Funding for the MX missile. And Koki looks up and says, excuse me, but is there funding for mammogram research and the and mammograms in the bill and for cancer, breast cancer research? And that symbolized the difference to have someone like Koki there to ask that question. And that had never been asked previously because that perspective was not re reflected. So there are a lot of downsides to the current media, but the growing diversity is a plus. Great. Uh, so uh, we have someone from the audience, Adna, who wants to know if Koki had ever visited Israel um, as a religious Catholic then, um, what was her impressions of Israeli society if she did? Um, so. She did visit Israel. Uh, she did visit Israel uh, when um, uh, Jack's mother was about five or six and her brother was about uh, eight. We were still based in Athens and we did a trip to Israel. Um, and we um, uh, did it very much as a um, interfaith family. We took uh, a children's Bible as we traveled the country. We looked at, we visited sites that were holy to both of our faith traditions. Um, and uh, it was a, uh, it was a very, it was a wonderful trip. And, and, and part of what made it so meaningful to her, as well as to me, uh, my grandfather, Abe, uh, Avram Rogovsky had been a Zionist pioneer in Palestine in the early 20th century. He was a chalutz, um, as a, the, the Hebrew word, and um, uh, Koki knew him well. Uh, he was alive when uh, we met, um, 
uh, and um, uh, she loved uh, visiting the places and uh, hearing the stories about my grandfather's youth in Israel. Um, but there was one painful footnote there, and I have to be honest about this. When I wrote, I wrote an article for the New York Times travel section about um, uh, traveling to Israel with the kids and uh, as an interfaith family. And I must say, I got a wave of very critical mail, almost entirely from Jewish readers who were very upset that I had married outside the faith and very upset that I was taking my uh, half-breed children to Israel. Uh, and a number of them, uh, I wrote about my grandfather and I wrote about um, visiting the places he had lived uh, uh, as a young pioneer. And a number of these writers said, well, your sainted grandfather probably would turn over in his grave knowing you would marry this Catholic. And what was so profoundly unfair and painful to me was that toward the end of his life, when he didn't recognize other people, didn't even recognize his own kids, the person he kept asking for was Koki because she had been so kind to him. And for people to impose their own prejudices on the reality of our family and the reality of Koki's affection for my family, it was just very painful. But the trip in the end was, 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 a, was a great trip and, and, and Koki loved being there. It was part of, an important part of her continuing embrace of my, of my traditions and my faith. Thank you. Well, we're coming up at the end of our hour, unfortunately. This has been just such a, a great uh, personal um, conversation, um, some really great insights. And thank you for like sharing both of you um, so freely your, your life with Koki and um, how special that she was, um, not only to your family, but really to the rest of the world um, and, and how her legacy will live on. This has just been a great hour. And so, um, and so Jack, uh, until we were talking before that got started, you've got papers to write, so we don't want to keep you on here too long. It's coming <laughs> to the end of term there. And, uh, and I'd imagine Stephen, you, you're saying that you're very busy with this book tour with multiple events per day, which is great. Um, we're so happy for both of you. And again, we want to remind you, we do have somebody here on in the, in the chat that said um, that uh, they're going to be uh, this was a wonderful conversation and that they're going to be at Labyrinth tomorrow to buy the book because as a woman who moved to Princeton to be with her two young grandchildren, she's really appreciating, Steve, what you had said early on about what it means to be a good grandmother. And so your words tonight are, are touching people in many ways. And um, that's really wonderful. And, 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 you know, Jack, we appreciate you taking time out of writing your papers and, and being a student to come on here and talk to your grandfather and and Steve, we just want to thank you for making this a personal event for the Princeton community. We'd hope to have you here in person. Um, of course, the um, virus had different ideas, um, <laughs> but maybe next time um, you're in town, we can we can arrange something. Or um, I certainly hope so. And and Jack, I think what I see a bright future ahead for you. So again, Koki, a life well lived is at Labyrinth Books. Uh, Dorte, if you're still online, you want to drop the link in there. It can be ordered online and delivered. And if uh, you're local and you go in the store and give the code Roberts at checkout, you'll get your 10% discount, or you can enter Roberts into the um, checkout uh, link when you, if you're buying online and get a discount. And uh, we encourage you to stay up to date with other, other author events coming up, both at the library and at Labyrinth. Sometimes we partner, sometimes we do different things, but we always are having lots of wonderful authors come through. And this has been a wonderful way uh, to spend an evening. So thank you to you both. I'm going to log off now. You have any final words? Uh, just uh, that uh, uh, one of Koki's girlhood friends said to me, uh, a Sacred Heart girl whose sister was a Sacred Heart nun, still is a Sacred Heart nun, um, and uh, said to me, you know, I am um, uh, i don't want one of those bracelets that says WWJD. I want one of those bracelets that says WWCD. What would Koki do? And that's my most important message from this book, that uh, Everybody can learn something from um, how Koki lived her life. And I hope you enjoy the book. Okay, thank you. Okay, good night, everybody. Good night.